Hello, and welcome to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. In this video, we'll just be doing a short discussion of the uh, basic assumptions in uh, trusses. We'll be discussing the uh, trust member condition or the, the pinned uh, member condition, and looking at uh, what happens when we go and apply uh, when we go and apply a pinned uh, member condition to uh, both ends of a member, uh, and when we also apply the other assumptions that are uh, present within trust theory. We'll be looking at that and what kind of uh, special condition that produces uh, in regards to the internal forces within a member. Okay. So let us begin then. Again, so we'll have a relatively short lecture today, maybe just 20 minutes, but that's fine. We were covering a lot of important logistics. So uh, let's talk. So the topic for today that we're is, is uh, so again, the topic for today is that we're going to introduce trusses. And trusses have a few uh, key uh, definitions. And I would define, now you can define a truss many ways, but I think the most important or the simplest way to define a truss is a framework I would define a truss as a framework or a frame uh, composed of straight members connected by pin joints. And so that's sort of a basic uh, a basic uh, uh, simple definition of a truss. And if I wanted to really be technical, I could say uh, I could consider an idealized truss or an ideal truss. So this is essentially what a truss is, but then an ideal truss, again, is kind of just an engineering model. You can't ever have a perfectly ideal truss, but a perfectly ideal truss would be one where uh, all pin joints, uh, all members are perfectly straight, Uh, would be perfectly straight. Uh, perfect zero friction pins. And all loads applied at the pins. All loads applied uh, directly to the pins. All loads Uh, directly to pin joints. And it is important to keep in mind that there is no such thing as, as a, a perfectly ideal truss. Um, because again, think about what this entails. You need a truss, or you need a member, an element, that has, that needs these characteristics. So you need pin joints, and then they need to be perfectly, so let's just go back, go through them and see why this is impossible. Uh, why a true ideal truss is impossible. Um, first, you need a perfectly straight element. And that when I say perfectly straight, I mean perfectly straight. It needs to be beyond atomic precision levels of perfectly straight. Um, in other words, if you could trace this from one end to the other, it should not even deviate by a single atom's width, which of course is impossible for anything actually made of matter. Um, even if, you, you know, if nothing else, I don't care how good you build it, um, eventually you have to worry about really obscure things like gravitational waves disrupting the perfect uh, axial uh, straightness of your, uh, of your member here, of your truss member. So of course, this is, this is an idealization. Uh, zero friction pins, those of course can't exist. Uh, there and there, there is always going to be some element of internal friction within the pin joints, so uh, those of course are not perfectly possible. And we don't usually actually use pins in uh, truss uh, joints. We have things that we can model and analyze as pins, but and we can treat as pins for analysis purposes. But they do not; ha they're not true zero friction pins. And this is also impossible. All loads are applied directly at the joints. Uh, the reason uh, this is impossible is if you think think about something like gravity loading. Anyway, okay, so the um, uh, the reason it is impossible to have the all loads applied directly to the pin joints, well, the simply the simplest example of this is okay. When I say that, what I am assuming is I am assuming all of the load 
is applied directly to the pin joints. And you would have, uh, and when I say there are joints, I mean there would be other elements framing into them like these, etc. other pin joints connecting these. But the reason, think about how this would have to happen. Um, think about what this would entail. Um, when I say all the load, I mean all the load. And if nothing else, even if you didn't have any wind or seismic forces, etc., uh, as long as this is made of matter, and as long as this is not like in orbit, uh, there is always going to be self-weight along the length of the members. And thus, the own self, the actual, just simply the self-weight of a truss, a, tr a truss element's members uh, means that this will, is not, uh, that this uh, uh, idealization is not satisfied. So we know uh, that a that there are from these three uh, definitions of an idealized truss, none of them can ever actually hold. But again, this all comes down to some things we've talked about before in terms of engineering models. I think we briefly mentioned here and there. Uh, all of engineering is built on models. All of engineering is built on simplification. All of engineering is built on certain assumptions. You make certain, uh, as appropriate, you make certain assumptions. You make certain assumptions to simplify complex systems into uh, into uh, models that can then be actual, actually analyzed uh, to a certain level of precision. And trusses really, I think, are one of the best examples of that. Um, we have three assumptions that are necessary, that are going to be completely necessary for the analyses that we'll be performing, but each one of them is actually, in, a, in the physical world, completely impossible. You can't have a perfectly straight member. You can't have perfectly frictionless pins. And you certainly can't have members that don't at least have self-weight applying across their length. But at the end of the day, that is fine. Uh, engineering is all based on the idea of taking the complex realities of the world and taking a very complex system and making some educated assumptions to reduce it to something that can actually be designed and analyzed. Okay, so those are the core assumptions of trust design. And But I want to look at what happens. Um, something, And the reason these are so important is that when you make these assumptions, uh, something very special happens. And let's take a look at this. So these three assumptions, all members are perfectly straight, uh, zero friction pins, and all the loads apply directly to the joints. When you assume this, something very special happens um, with the internal forces inside members. So let's look at that. Okay, so let's consider a uh, a general member, and then let's consider a uh, a member that has that uh, that uh, has the assumptions that we've applied. So, I as a review, a general member or a general uh, frame member, a general frame member uh, is capable of transferring three types of forces. It's capable of transmitting axial force, uh, which I could define as a P or an N. So it'd be like something like, oh, maybe something like this. So maybe I would call this, if I call this end A and this end B, I would have N A and an N B. Then I would have shears. I might have a V B and a V A. And then I could have moments, maybe an MB and an MA. By default, uh, for most frame members, if you have, uh, and what, when I say most frame members, I mean members that are rigidly connected. In other words, you have one element 
um, rigidly connecting to another one like this without any kind of moment or force release in the uh, joint there. By default, this is the kind of forces that will be able to transfer through that joint. And therefore, these are the types of forces that will also, uh, if I, in other words, if I cut this member at any location, if I cut this, this column at any location or this beam at any location, uh, these are the types of forces of various magnitudes that I would expect to find when I cut a typical frame member at, the, at those locations. However, when I go and impose the assumptions that we looked at um, for our idealized truss, uh, something kind of magical happens. Well, I shouldn't say magical. Uh, it's, it's physics, not magic, but I suppose uh, from a certain point of view, physics is magic. We, we have, uh, we could talk about Clark's laws and uh, any suitably advanced technology is, indis is indistinguishable from magic. Although this really isn't suitably advanced technology, this is just basic Newtonian physics. In case you're not aware of Clark's law, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh -huh. Ah, so the question is, why are they, uh, why are they in the same direction? Should they be opposing each other? Yes, um, I just kind of drew them in an arbitrary direction. Um, we're not going into de uh, detail about, uh, we're not analyzing this in any detail. If I wanted to make uh, certain, depending on the type of analysis you're doing, sometimes you do want to put them in opposite directions. Like we're going to be, do, we're going to actually do that when we analyze trusses. Uh, for more complex frame analyses, I might just assume everything is positive and acting maybe to the right or something. But uh, the directions here are just somewhat arbitrary. I'm just trying to illustrate the types of forces that exist within them. So don't worry too much about the directions of any of these in this case. Is that okay? Okay, perfect. Okay. Uh, now, an interesting bit of trivia, if you're, uh, if you're not, uh, uh, I'm not sure if any of y'all have ever heard of Clark's Laws, named after a uh, famous author, uh, Arthur C. Clark, but the uh, Clark's three laws go something like, uh, I think the first law is uh, if, a, uh, if a old and wise professor in a field says that something is possible, they are almost certainly right. The second law, if they say that something is impossible, they are almost certainly wrong. And the third law is any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. But uh, anyway, that has very little to do with trusses. So let's look at the pinned member condition. Oh, that is not how you spell member. Pinned member condition. And no, that will not be on the exam, just for your own uh, edification. So, uh, uh, Clark's Laws, anyway. So, uh, the pinned member condition. Let's see what happens when we go and apply a pinned member condition uh, to a uh, member, to an element. And again, I'm, and I'm also going to be assuming this is a perfectly straight element. So, this thing has a couple pins on it. And first of all, um, let's, uh, because it's pinned, because we have a pinned member, because both ends are pinned, uh, they are not going to be capable of transferring moment between them. We have, uh, we we are assuming pins. We are assuming idealized pins. We are assuming perfect zero friction rotational uh, joints, perfect moment releases at the ends of these members. So what that means is that if you, again, if you have member end A and end B, because they are pinned, uh, because they're pinned. M A has to equal M B, which has to equal zero. The moments that are carried uh, uh, at the ends, transferred at the ends, must be zero. Okay, so that's one thing. But uh, let's let me go ahead and do a free body diagram of, a, of an element like this, um, and I'm going to draw it horizontally. Uh, I'm going to apply equilibrium about the axes of the member, because uh, as we've seen previously, we can go and as we've seen in statics and earlier in this course, uh, you can always take equilibrium about any uh, set of parallel uh, perpendicular axes. If something is in equilibrium, the uh, if something is to be in equilibrium, the axes that we choose some forces about are the actual direction of the x and y axes are irrelevant, and so any axes, uh, should, any convenient set of axes or axes should be uh, applicable as we uh, apply equilibrium.
In other words, if something is going to be equilibri in equilibrium, oh my goodness, if something is going to be in equilibrium about any set of axes, it must be in equilibrium about all sets of axes. So I am going to put this, um, this element now right along the x-axis. And this is just going to make the math a little bit easier, avoid a few cosines and sines and such. So I'll have end A here, and I'll have end B. And these will be joined together by member AB, and I have my x-axis and my y-axis. Now, again, because I have uh, pin joints, there are no moments uh, at, each, at either end of the beam. So the only potential uh, forces I'll have will be um, horizontal and vertical forces, or namely shear and, shear and axial force, which I'm just going to label. I'm just going to assume uh, for convenience sake that these are uh, pointing upward and to the right, uh, just for convenience sake here. So say we have something like this, a uh, maybe like an N, B. Again, the directions are somewhat arbitrary, uh, at least for this lesson. And maybe a VB, like here. And an NA. And a, a VB, or a VA, I should say. For a shear and axial force, I'm sorry, VA like so. So um, let me go and uh, next just run through a few equations in equilibrium and I can just do a summation. Let's do a summation of moments about point A. Well, NA, VA, and NB uh, suggest that, or uh, NA, NB, and VA have their lines of action passing through point A, so they will generate no moment about that point. Um, so let me go ahead and give this thing a length of L as well. So if I do a summation of moments about point A, I would just have VB times L is equal to zero. I would just have VB times L is equal to zero. And uh, I can divide both sides by L and conclude that VB thus is equal to zero. The shear at uh, uh, transferred uh, through point B is therefore zero. And I can do the same thing uh, if I do it, if I go and do a summation of moments about point B, very similar, I will get that VA is equal to zero. So there is also no shear force transferred at the pins. And then I can do, if you do a summation of forces in the X direction or with the X direction along the axis of the member, you will conclude that NA has to be equal to negative NB. In other words, they have to be, because those are the only forces that exist on the member, after we've eliminated, after we have eliminated um, both the moment and the shear at the, at the uh, element ends, we're going to have, uh, we only have our axial force, and that is, uh, those must be equal and opposite. So, combining this together, we can get the, uh, we can distill down the pinned member end condition, or the pinned member condition, which is as follows. And then again, it just comes out of elementary statics. And so putting all this together, distilling this down, we see that for a member, a member a uh, straight member with, uh, with forces applied only at the joints uh, with uh, pinned ends uh, perfectly straight and with loads only at joints. What this does is results in the member carries only a single axial force. Because again, the end forces are equal and opposite. A single axial force. And that force can either be a compressive force and uh, or a tension force. So I might call this just F or F. 
and in terms of sign convention, we're going to refer to a, a tensile force as positive and a compression, uh, compression force as negative. So uh, I know I went through that fairly quickly, but the, uh, for time's sake, but um, the basic idea is uh, when you have a member that satisfied this, these assumptions, anytime you have a perfectly straight member with, with ideal pin ends and you have one and you have no forces applied in between those pins, just from basic statics alone, uh, we will know that that member must carry a only a single axial force, uh, either compression or tension. And that again comes simply out of our basic assumptions that we've made uh, for truss members. So sometimes I refer to this as the pinned member condition or the truss member condition. All of those are largely interchangeable. And we're going to, and because of this, uh, when if, now it, this is for we've looked at a single member, but if you then go and construct an entire framework out of uh, elements like this, you get a truss, and that and we'll be able to use the this truss member condition uh, to analyze even fairly complex trusses uh, with relatively simple mathematics. All right, so I think that'll do it. Uh, I just wanted to introduce the truss member condition today, and I think that will do for now. Okay. So, uh, any questions? Any questions on this? Uh, we'll go to office hours after this. Uh, if you have any questions, especially on the homework, um, but uh, this will do it for uh, the uh, for the uh, introduction to, to truss numbers and uh, trusses. All right, that'll do it for today. This is just meant to be a short introduction to truss theory, uh, in particular discussing the assumptions that are built into truss theory and uh, doing a little bit of a quick dive into the. Uh, Truss pinned member condition, where you, if you apply a, if you have a straight member connected by pin joints with no uh, loads between the joints, you end up with a uh, an element, a member that will carry only a single axial, uh, either compressive or tensile force, and we will use this as we move forward in the course, uh, of exploring in detail further aspects of truss theory. So if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. Uh, if you have any um, other thoughts, please uh, like, comment, and subscribe to make the robots happy. Uh, regardless, I I we will be looking at, we'll be continuing our look at trusses, uh, looking a bit more at trust theory in our next lecture. And uh, regardless, I hope you found this informative, a little bit enjoyable perhaps, uh, or at least maybe a little bit interesting. And I hope to see you all again soon. And as always, thank you.